welcome to the Newburyport Literary Festival. If this is your first event or your 15th, this is my 15th and it's been a great two days. I've been really happy. My name is Leslie Hendrickson. I'm on the steering committee of the festival. And we've, as I said, had a great festival this year. This is our second online season and our 16th edition. Um, of course, we hope we're back in person next year, but we have been really thrilled that this format has allowed us to bring a lot of new and different authors to the festival. And in fact, we have more than 100 participants this year, which is the most we've ever had. Just a few housekeeping notes. You may have heard this already from me if you've been to other sessions, but we're using the webinar format. You'll see and hear the panelists. You will not be able to see yourselves. If you have comments, please chat. Use the chat box. Um, we'd love to hear where you're from, if this is your first time at the festival, or you've been to every session. Um, but if you have questions, please use the Q&A tab below. That lets the presenters see the questions clearly and keep them organized. You probably know that yesterday was Independent Bookstore Day. And we want to support our independent bookstore partners. Uh, the Bookshop of Beverly Farms and Jabberwocky Bookshop in Newburyport both have all of the books from the authors in the festival. We encourage you to support them or your local independent bookshop. I'm going to post the links to the bookshops in the chat and you can check them out there. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our amazing panelists. Crystal Maldonado is a writer by day and a marketer and social media manager. I think I, I, I it's, it's yeah, those, yeah. I get it. She's a writer by <laughs> night and she's also a marketer and social media manager, excuse me. Uh, she's been published in Latina Magazine, The Hartford Current and Dogster. And she's the co-founder of the online magazine, Positively Smitten. Fat Chance, Charlie Vega is her debut novel and was bought in a competitive preempt as part of a two book deal. She lives in Western Massachusetts with her husband, her dog, and her super duper adorable baby daughter. Kim Johnson has led, has held leadership positions in social justice organizations since she was a teen. She's now a college administrator who maintains civic engagement throughout the community while also mentoring black student activists and leaders. This is My America is also her debut novel. She has degrees from the University of Oregon and the University of Maryland College Park. She lives in Oregon with her two kids. Ray Stovey is a writer. They received the 2016-2017 Made It Hugo House Fellowship for their young adult fiction and created the young adult middle grade trans and non-binary voices master list, a database that tracks all the books in those age categories written by trans authors about trans characters. They are a contributor to Take the Mic, fictional stories of everyday resistance. Between Perfect is Real and Real is also their debut novel. When they're not writing, they can be found gardening, making art in other mediums, and hiking in their beloved Pacific Northwest. Natalia Martinez was born and raised in Bogota, Colombia. As a young adult, she moved to the United States and earned a BA in philosophy and psychology from Emmanuel College in Boston. She's a former public school teacher and now works with the Cambridge Public Health Department as an early literacy coach. Despite her close relationship with board and picture books, because she also has a super duper adorable toddler <laughs> who also happens to be my nephew, young adult literature is her favorite genre. She is not an author, but she is an eager reader. And with that, I will give it to you, Natalia. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Les. Um, so thank you all to all of our writers uh, for being here. Uh, I was saying to a couple of you earlier that I had such a great time reading your books. And as um, Leslie mentioned, I have a toddler, so I don't get a lot of reading done these days. But um, <laughs> your books were such a pleasure to to dig into that um, it it made it easy for me. So um, I really, really enjoyed your books. Um, I wanted to start with uh, an introduction um, of each one of you. Um, 
maybe you can tell us a little bit about why you wrote the book, uh, what inspired you. I think that, um, you know, from reading the book, I know that there's a lot of you and your personal life in the book. Uh, but I want to hear from you, um, you know, like the reasons that inspired you to, to write your books. Uh, Crystal, why don't we start with you? Sure. So thank you so much for your kind words about the book being good. Like, that's so nice. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I really wanted to write uh, Fat Chance Charlie Vega. Honestly, it came from the idea of writing a story that centered a fat brown girl at the main as a main character. Um, so when I was growing up, I just felt like I was so different than everybody else around me. Um, and, you know, I have the same identity as Charlie. So I was fat and I was Puerto Rican and had glasses. And at the time, nobody had glasses. And so it just felt like weird. And um, I just, I got the sense that, you know, I wished I was different. And so I wanted to write a story that flipped that whole idea on its head and made someone who was like me as that heroine and made her somebody who you like wanted to be friends with hopefully and someone who discovers their greatness and doesn't have to change anything about them um, except how they sort of view themselves so even though it ends up being a story that's you know about this fat girl and she's learning to love her body and love herself i think that hopefully there are pieces that anybody can sort of relate to anyone who's ever felt insecure or felt a little like a weirdo and God, haven't we all felt like that sometimes? <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks, Crystal. I think I definitely want to be friends with Charlie. Uh, so That's the best. Thank you. <laughs> goal achieved. Uh, Ray, would you want to go next? Sure. Um, yeah, I can relate to the glasses thing. <laughs> and I would like to point out that the three of us panelists all are wearing really fabulous yep. glasses. So, yes. <laughs> you know, we were ahead of the fashion. We game. were. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, for me, um, uh, a couple reasons for Between Perfect and Real, it started out like, I mean, 10 years ago when I was like a 20 year old baby um, and had an idea for a book because I was just starting to like question my own gender. And I was thinking about like my, you know, recent past as a teenager. And I was like, what if I had been able to play gender affirming roles in high school? And so Dean really started as like a kernel of wish fulfillment. And then when I actually started writing the book in earnest in 2015, um, I wanted to, I think like a lot of marginalized authors write um, the book that I didn't have as a teen because I didn't have, there wasn't a single trans character in any books that I read growing up, even queer books um, that were written by trans authors. And the one trans character that I remember um, was written by a cis author. They were a secondary character and I'm pretty sure they died at the end of the book. So <laughs> um, I wanted to, you know, uh, tell a coming out story that wasn't rooted in tragedy that you know, it was real about the struggles, but also about the joys because I love being queer and trans and um, I wanted to like write a book that showed that nuance. Yeah, and um, can I say all the titles are awesome, like best titles ever. So, yes. I, you know, I think that just is such an amazing thing when you can sort of like take your story and put it into a title. Um, you know, really similar to Ray and, and Crystal, the representation was really important to me. And, um, you know, at the time that I was writing, starting to think about This Is My America, it was really around 2015 and 2016 where the Black Lives Matter movement was growing. And for me being someone who grew up as an activist, my first, you know, memory of really seeing police brutality and um, how the criminal justice system can fail us was seeing Rodney King and seeing what happened with the trial. And there were no books for me to process that as a young person, to understand it, not only what was happening, um, other than going back and looking at you know, historical elements of you know, slavery and other kinds of things and the civil rights movement, um, but also really nothing around what do I do? And um, 
you know, I have kids and I had a son that was really sort of pivotal in my thinking about, I want to be able to write books that young people, one, can see themselves too, um, but two, that, that processing, that understanding and that building of empathy was really important to me. And um, I also was, you know, really tired of seeing um, really, you know, black, white, conversations around issues of police brutality and seeing it as that is the one issue when in, it's just a sliver of many problems within our criminal justice system and just in our society in general. And so I wanted to write something that was really um, nuanced, that had past is still the present, um, that really talked about the sort of generational um, transfer of these issues um, happening across communities. Um, and that really was sort of like my, my grounding. And I, and I also didn't want it to be a story that was just about the, the pain, right? The experience of, of what was happening. I wanted there to be a young black girl who was an activist at the front and wasn't just having things happen to her, but she was doing something to resolve that, um, to, to really empower young people to see that, yes, there's terrible things that are happening in the world, but you can use your power in, in whatever way that, that, it, that works for you um, in order to make change. Thanks, Kim, and thanks, Ray. Um, you guys all kind of dove into uh, my second question, which was, what was the book you wanted to read when you were a teen or a young adult? Uh, a lot of you guys already um, kind of covered that, uh, but is there anything else you would want to add if I had asked that question first? <laughs> I mean, there's so much. That yeah. <laughs> it, was, it, it was so lacking. I mean, it really, um, it was so lacking and empty in terms of the kinds of, of characters. And, you know, I'm such a, a strong believer in reading allows empathy and understanding and you know all through k-12 reading books never by a black author um with a black main character you know the black characters that i read were you know um like small small characters that something happened to them as part of the story and you know i don't you know and even growing up i didn't need to just read stories about black kids right in in my i mean just the like all representation of diversity would have been important to me. And, um, you know, there's so much. And, and I, I love um, seeing more and more the range and the breadth and intersectionality in storytelling. I think that's really amazing because we also can't just have particular binaries and certain kinds of stories um, because that still is also lacking in, in depth in the reality of how things are. And so, it was a gazillion things that I wish that I, that I had. It's amazing now to be in this space, you know, right now, even on this panel, um, you know, with incredible stories that these my fellow authors have, have written. Um, and there's so much more that still needs to be told. Yeah, we're making good progress, but it's still like so small, right? Like I want to, I feel like you can have two people who have the exact same identities and their stories are wildly different from each other. And so that's why there is this real importance and this real need to have all different kinds of stories that exist because we talk about like the windows and mirrors thing, right? So you want a book to hold up a mirror for some people and show them their own reflection, but then also let them see into someone else's world who they wouldn't otherwise get to see into. Mm -hmm. And so I grew up in a very homogenous, you know, white, like middle-class town. And I think about, you know, the books that were part of our curriculum and how I was not, I think I was a senior in high school for the, when I, read a book by a person of color and it was my choice. It was like, oh, you can finally pick a book <laughs> that you get to read. And I chose a book by Maya Angelou and it, everything up until then had been our traditional classics, right? Which have their place. Um, but it was alienating. Like you, you know, you're a teenager, you can't really relate to these books that have been written 50, 60, 70 years ago. Yeah. And especially if you're not like, a wealthy white dude, you're reading this and you're like, I, I have nothing in common with these characters. 
And so there is something really important about being able to read a book that feels like it gets you. It helps validate you during such like a pivotal time when mm-hmm. you're figuring out who you are and who you want to be and you're finding kind of your place in the world. And so to me, there can never be enough. <laughs> I, I, I'm greedy. There can never be enough diversity in books. Like give it to, all to me, you know? <laughs> yeah. I think you both really said it all and I'll just agree. I just want more and more. And I think like, especially for marginalized authors, like specifically, you know, for trans authors, but in, I think in all communities, there's the burden of being like the, the pressure of being like the first one or even the mm-hmm. second one or the third one or the fourth one. And until you reach that critical mass, there's so much pressure put on books to like educate and inspire and be right. good and be like all yes. these things and like I don't want between perfect and real to be the trans mask coming about story coming out story I want it to be one of many and then I want a lot of other books about all different kinds of trans people and we're just starting to see that happen um, for trans folks and I think um, like for everyone too and it's it's exciting to be at the beginning of the snowball and I'm excited to see where it ends up. Mm-hmm. And I just want to say one more thing, just added to what Ray said. I think we will know when we have the, have had the like right representation, where um, you know underrepresented and marginalized authors uh, can actually fail at a book, mm-hmm. and then write get another book, right? Yes. Because we <laughs> have not had that opportunity um, to to fail right? You have to be exceptional. You have to hit all of these markers. You have to give um, give an audience that actually often doesn't even represent you all of the feels that they want. And and I think until we, we get to fail, then we actually ha- don't have enough books <laughs> that, that, you know, that are, that are out there. Yeah. Yeah, totally agreed. And like making room for stories that show marginalized characters, but don't necessarily tackle issues head on right like let's just write joyful stories like there's a lot of pressure like like Ray said on on marginalized authors to cover everything and to share trauma and to share things that are incredibly difficult sometimes and painful and like sometimes I you know like I want to just write about love and I just want that (laughs) to be a thing you know (laughs) so yes more books please (laughs) So you guys are reading my mind. My third question <laughs> was about like, do you think there's been progress in representation and inclusivity in in young adult literature and in like publishing in general? Um, so, I mean, it's correct slow. me if I'm wrong. From it's what slow. you guys are saying is like, there is, but you know, there's a, there's a whole world uh, of, of inclusivity that we have yet to to cover because then we start thinking about it um or at least as i was taught when i was in school when you think about inclusivity or representation it's usually limited to race and culture Mm -hmm. Uh, but i think we're finally especially in in books and in books like you guys's um it's starting to to show us that inclusivity and representation go beyond that, you know, it's it's faith, is gender identity, is so many aspects of, of our lives. Um, and then so there's keep, also the piece, sorry, not to- No, 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 go for just, it. I was just gonna say, there's also the piece of like the actual authors and how they get treated and what kind of deals they get and what kind of promotion and marketing help they get. And it's like, that's a little bit the business side, but it's also meaningful in terms of having a bigger effect after, right? So like, if there there can't just be one book about a fat Puerto Rican girl, like that can't be it, right? There's got to be room for others. And we want like, treatment for those authors to be really good too so (laughs) that's like the I feel like the other side of the issue yeah there's been progress um it's slow and the things that I just continue especially with the the book that I wrote and you know I don't know if um uh Ray or um Crystal connect in this way is that then you are your book is then compared to another book and I see it all the time you know, when people talk about my book of like, oh, it's better than this other book, or it's not as good as 
you know, like the books I've always compared to, it's The Hate You Give, Dear Martin, All American Boys. And it, and it, it has to be better or worse, right? Mm-hmm. And it's like, no, this is a different book. Like, like yes. this, you can't actually read all of these books and they can all, you know, be really great. It doesn't have to be, you know, like, wait, no, this is the book on race that you should, you should read. Or this is the, this, you know, I could, yeah. I could just totally see Ray even like, this is the, no, this is the trans book that you should be reading. It's like, no, they can all be amazing. And I, and I've heard that so much from my fantasy writer friends, Black writer friends, um, who talk about, you know, that there, um, there can be so many stories about princesses, or there can be so many stories about, you know, these kinds of things that sort of like occur in this particular world. But if you happen to have two black ones, it's like, it can't happen, right? right. You know, like it just, it, then they get compared, like, no, 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 that one was better than that one. And it's like, um, that, that the dichotomy is so problematic. And I think people don't really realize when they're saying those kinds of things, like, yes, you can have your favorite book, but if you compare it as it's like, no, this is the one that will teach you the most about <laughs> this kind of thing. And it's, and it's like, that's not what we're trying to do here. <laughs> we're mm-hmm. not trying to, to write the one book that will cover all of the things. Yeah. And if what you want is um, education, like you can be taught by reading, a lot of different books that are on like a similar subject like I love that there are so many books now about teens who get involved in protests um like that didn't exist when I was a kid and I went to Iraq war protests and I had friends who organized protests when I was in high school in the early 2000s um and like so that's just like one sliver I think of like there should be a lot of books about teens who are taking part in protests and a lot of books like I feel like I've learned so much just from reading widely in YA, you know, about different Mm -hmm. identities that are like different from mine as a white trans person. Um, And like, that's a place that like, we're really lacking in trans rep is that it's mostly like, most of the books coming out this year are white trans masculine authors. And that's a problem. and and other my last question before we open it up uh, to to our audience is um, is there any thoughts or uh, tips advice that you would give our aspiring young writers uh, that want to have a more like add more representation to young adult literature? Um, I remember as a former public school teacher, I work with middle schoolers and um, they are like, they are the, you know, the real thing that shows you like books like this matter. Uh, Books that have stories of um, the Puerto Rican girl, the black girl whose dad is in jail, of the trans person that is like going to um, audition for their school theater play. all these things really have an impact on young people. Um, and a lot of these young people that have an activist soul um, are, you know, I think are trying to find their voice. And so is there any tips, thought or advice that uh, you would want to share with our young, young folks? Yeah, I think reading a lot was, is going to help. Um, for me, that is huge, right? Like my TBR pile is a mile high, it feels like, and I'm slowly, slowly making my way through it. But just being able to read different stories, stories that are not like yours, stories from perspectives that are not similar to yours, stories that challenge your ideas, stories that just open up your world a little bit, I think is a great way to start. And it helps you not only learn more about people and be more empathetic, but it helps you figure out what you as maybe a writer, what do you like and what what stories do you like to tell? What tropes do you like? What tropes do you hate? All those things. And it's it's like doing research. Like you're getting to read a beautiful book and also learning about like who you are kind of as a writer, as a person. So that I think is a really important thing. Um, and then kind of going off what Kim said, like even if your idea for whatever you would like to write or share is similar to something else that's out there, that's okay. There's room for for stories that are similar, especially when it 
it's you're a marginalized author um, or because let's have all of the like black princess stories. Let's have all the Puerto Rican stories. Like let's, let's have all these trans stories. Let's make room for multiple different versions and no one's going to tell your story the same way that you are. So like, I would say, don't let that stop you um, from, from going out there and, and trying to, to share your words with the world because we need more of it. Thanks, Crystal. Uh, Ray or Kim, is there anything else that you guys would like to share before we open it up to questions from the audience? Um, I think like for me, I remember when I was a young person um, in high school, there was an after school writing group that was at my high school that I was lucky enough to like be part of. Um, and so like, if that is something that you have access to, you know, where you live like often there will be like you know um we have another organization in town that runs like drop-in tutoring and like english and creative writing is a part of that and they do workshops and then hugo house which also does like summer workshops for teens um but just like finding i think community or like other people who are writing um that was like such a huge part of my my experience as a teenager and that was a, a place where I felt like safe and heard and like I could like find my voice um, and so finding community like creative community with other teens like spoken word is also a really great outlet like mm -hmm. I went to like spoken word events when I was in high school and I was a spoken word poet for a little bit um, you know in my mid-20s and that's another like wonderful community where you can learn so much like about finding your own voice and your style and like um, confidence and the community and a really diverse community too. Um, like I, you know, met a lot of trans people through spoken word. Um, so just finding other teens that are doing creative things and making community with them can be really supportive. Yeah, I totally agree with what, you know, Ray said, you know, in terms of their experience doing, you know, spoken word in other ways. Um, I didn't grow up as thinking I was a writer. Um, I didn't even try to write. I love, actually, I loved spoken word, but I would like say other people's spoken word stuff. I didn't think I could be like creative in writing. I loved lyrics. I loved music. Um, so much of that, I think, are inspirations in terms of my own storytelling. And so I think with, you know, young writers, just be creative. Um, it's really, really important to be creative and um, and just try to to write as much as you can and and test the boundaries of storytelling. Also, Grave Crystal, you, you have to really read widely. It's so important, um, not only just to, to understand storytelling, but the different kinds of ways of storytelling, especially across different communities that actually, you know, the way that they tell stories are, are can be different, you know? Um, and sometimes if you're not used to that, it can be jarring of like, wait, it's not going in the way that I'm used to things going. Um, and, and that might feel weird, but it's like, no, you just haven't read enough to really sort of recognize the different storytelling. I think for young readers who, um, I'll say for young white uh, writers who um, are conscious of wanting to have good representation, not wanting to tell stories that are just white, cis, heteronormative kind of stories. I think that that's so important, but it's also important for you to sort of understand the depths of your ability to write um, characters that maybe are not your background, especially when they're, they're the main character, and also to know enough not to fall into particular tropes of if they're um, you know, not all of the sort of like identities that you represent, that they're, that character isn't the one uplifting or is harmed or is sort of like at the sake of the main character. Um, I also really encourage for those that are like very, very conscious and they want to, to tell their stories um, and to tell diverse stories. I think that actually is really incredible to talk about, like if you all your entire community is like white, <laughs> like your entire community is white, you're like, ah, oh, this is so boring. What am I gonna do when I write? You can actually write about why is it so white, right? Like what is that particular experience for people who, you know, maybe don't fit the culture of that particular community. And that could be from like, 
you know, um, body fat representation, or that could be from, um, you know, um, psychological elements or all kinds of things. And I think that there's ways to sort of critique and think about your own particular community and why they operate and maybe using a lens to look at the ways in which, you know, why are all the kids at my school like this, but then all the other kids at this other school are much more diverse. I mean, I think that is a space that has not been, um, you know, explored as much by white writers. I think there's a sort of assumption that like, I need to go tell the story because there's not enough of these stories. And it's like, no, you might not necessarily need to be the one to tell that story, mm -hmm. um, but you can, you know, be aware enough about how do you explore it. And if you do have particular characters that you, are, you know, that you're not writing, in, you're not writing harmful representation because what you have, um, you know, received in media and books is harmful representation because there hasn't been enough representation right. that's there. And so I think that piece is really, really important for, for writers who want to be conscious writers that maybe don't have particular identities that they really do want to represent. Oh, and if I can just add one resource, I think We Need Diverse Books does a really phenomenal job of touching on all of this stuff. So if you're early and you're, you know, you're young and you're just trying to get your feet wet, I feel like follow them on Instagram, right? Like read some of the books that they're recommending. And I think that sets you up really nicely to talk about some of these things that Ray talked about and Kim and have a really nice full represent, representative book um, that doesn't do harm and that does add to the conversation. Thank you guys, those are really wonderful tips, advice, thoughts, <laughs> et cetera. Um, so um, thank you for everybody that uh, in the audience that has already submitted some questions. I encourage everybody else who has a question to write them in the question and answer feature of our Zoom call. Uh, but I will start with the first question of one of our audience members, and it is what can schools do to help the process um, of representation with our uh, teens and young adults? Have more books by <laughs> diverse authors. Sometimes it's hard to, um, when you, if you don't, you just, you, you don't know what you don't know. Um, I love Project Lit. There's a lot of schools that are Project um, lit schools and if you're not a project lit school or a school that is you know sort of specifically um, in the parameters of that particular program is but they have these amazing book lists and we need diverse books too also has like an app feature where you can look at books that are coming out um, the junior library guild for libraries does have lots of different options but um, it's so important that you have to like like exactly Crystal who are you following on social media? Are you following the lists that are letting you know diversely, looking at a lot of different communities, making sure that you're following them so that when they're talking about particular books that have good representation, that are written by um, authors of that particular identity, it makes it easier to, to identify and select the books. And then, um, really pushing it for, for all of all your students to read those books and not just, you know, yes, it's great if you have like a, a, a student who has, you know, a particular, you know, identity and you know that they're, they've been seeking that kind of stuff, yes, refer, but it shouldn't just be those people of that identity to read those books. They, you need to have them read widely. And, you know, I always say for my book, like if you have, you know, a, a non-Black student who loves mysteries, um, you can say, hey, you should read This Is My America because it has a great double murder mystery in it. Like there's layers to stories that, that you can actually use as ways to sort of hook someone into reading because sometimes people are just like, kind of like, oh, I don't know if that's for me because there's like a black girl on the cover, you know, <laughs> like there's other ways that you can kind of open the window for people to be able to read those books. Thanks, Kim. Um, so um, I'm seeing in a lot of the questions that people are asking are related. So I'm trying to compile them all. <laughs> um, so there is uh, another uh, question kind of um, asking you for advice or tips, resources. Um, 
to help parents encourage schools to keep heading um, in like a positive empathetic way with the way that they are um, choosing the books in their curriculum, uh, the type of themes that they're talking about in their ELA classes or other classes with your um, talking about this um, themes. So, um, you know, you guys mentioned already some great resources for, I think, teachers, and I'm sure parents can um, also dig into those. But is there any other ways that uh, you think parents could encourage schools um, to, you know, continue moving in this, in this path? I am not a huge, like I'm, I'm not hugely knowledgeable about like parents and schools and how that dynamic works because I do only have a toddler, but I will say <laughs> that I think, um, you know, encouraging like diverse reading in even like libraries and schools, I think can be a little bit easier than sometimes changing curriculum. So I think obviously like if you have the power to help encourage curriculum changes and encourage books to be part of classrooms, I think that's fantastic. But I know that sometimes there are a lot of hoops to jump through in order to get those changes. So sometimes it's a little easier to kind of go around that, right? And like get these books into the libraries in the schools or in the libraries in the system. And then it gets those books in front of teen readers, right? So that can be as simple as like, I saw this book that was recommended. I bought this book and now I'm donating it to my kid's school and I, I want them to have it. And now this is going to be like literally hand delivered to some of those students. Um, it can be like, it can be small things like that, right? Like, and, it, and I think parents who are interested in that also having these conversations at home and like, reading together or talking about books together, I think can be hugely helpful. And it doesn't just have to be books either. It can be ensuring you're consuming TV shows or, or movies or, you know, podcasts, whatever, whatever your choice is. If you do that and you ensure that all of those things have diverse representation, talk about some of these things that our books talk about, then suddenly it's like you're not even having to try to seek it out. You're, you're just naturally in that world and it doesn't become as much of like, oh my God, I need to read a book by a Puerto Rican person. So I better go look it up. It's more like I read this book and now I'm getting similar books recommended to me because I listened to a podcast that had an author on it who casually mentioned this thing that's sort of related. And then it, and then like Kim said, you know, changing your social media feeds too can be like wildly helpful as well. And so I know those are kind of roundabout ways, but I really do think there is like a domino effect that happens is like once you start making those conscious efforts and conscious changes, suddenly you don't have to try as hard because you're in the space and it's just easy, right? It's easy to now list off, oh, I've got these three great book recommendations for you and here you go. And it's and it's it becomes just part of the conversation. So I, I guess that's what I would recommend. Well, on that note, here is a great <laughs> question to follow that. Um, someone is asking uh, if each author can please share a representative young adult book that they have recently read and enjoyed. I love this question. I'm reading Firekeeper's Daughter right now. Um, oh my gosh. And I, I was just on a panel with the author and her name is Baby V. Um, is it An Angeline, right? Angeline uh, Bully. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I got you. <laughs> Angeline Bully. Yes. yes. Um, and that has that um is really great. Um, um native representation. Um, it's a mystery. That's a really, really great one that I'm reading um, right now. And then I list all my books on the side so people can see the, the books that I that I love to read. Um, if you like fantasy, uh, Namina Farnas, The Gilded Ones um, has been one that I've just been talking a lot about. So, um, oh, and then one more, um, Cameron Garrett's Off the Record will be coming out really soon. And um, it's, it's just it has all the like layers that I love. Um, she's a, a journalist writer um, exposing uh, Me Too issues. There's body fat representation in that book by um, black um, 
back writer. So, um, so those are just some of the books that I've been really into lately. Awesome, thank you. I also have a bunch of recommendations too. I feel like we could go all day with this, yeah, right? Yeah, be really good. <laughs> um, so I'm currently reading Somewhere Between Bitter and Sweet by Lake and Zay Kemp, which is a story about a Mexican-American girl and um, her name is Penn. And she has this love interest, Xander, who's an undocumented um, young man. And they work in a restaurant. And so it deals with a lot of like gentrification and um, very timely issues, I feel like. And it also has a lot of great food references. So you'll be really hungry if you read it. Um, and then one of my favorite reads of like just recent memory is um, Cemetery Boys by Aiden Thomas. Mm -hmm. They're just yeah. incredible, worthy of all of the awards and recognitions. Mm -hmm. Like read it, read it, read it. <laughs> it is one of my favorites. Yeah, um, you took the recommendation right out of oh, it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, Cemetery Boys is incredible. And um, also, like, I um, have really struggled to read throughout the pandemic. And I haven't read anything in YA um, in the past few months just because of, like, stuff in my personal life and um, trying to get, like, my book out in the world and stuff. Um, but I do like, if people are interested in more trans representation in particular, um, I do keep a database of trans authors who write trans characters on my website. Um, and there's at least like 20 books coming out this year alone. Um, Me Cute Diary by Emery Lee, May the Best Man Win by Z.R. Eller, um, The Unpopular Vote by Jasper Sanchez, um, Can't Take That Away by Stephen Salvatore just came out. Um, so there's just, um, there's a lot of books if you want them. <laughs> <laughs> and if you well, want to see what the cemetery boys looks yeah, like, I'm like, yes. oh, <laughs> <laughs> so many books, so little time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, all right. So our next question, uh, also a very exciting question is what attracted you to, uh, young adult literature as opposed to writing adult novels? I, I work with young people. I, I work in higher ed and um, I just love the energy that that young people have. Um, all their dreams and hopes haven't been squashed yet, mostly like most young people. like it's there still is like possibilities of hope and yeah. um, and I just find that so inspiring. And it actually ins it, it inspired me to start writing as seeing like all these young people who are like, I wanna do this and I'm doing this thing. And it's like, I can still do all of those things. And I think that that's why I just love that particular space. And I think the other thing for me is that I didn't have the kinds of experiences that I think as a young person that I wanted um, because I didn't get to be creative in the way that I think that I would have wanted to be, or have gotten to try different things in the way that I wanted. And so it's really nostalgic for me to be in a place and to be in a, a place that even though my characters aren't really like, they're not me, but my, my imagination allows me to jump into their heads and then tell this particular story. And I think that there's something really special about doing that. And, you know, you don't have to be a young adult to read this stuff. So I, like, I just read young adult in, in general, just because of that. Um, it just same. feels, it just feels like, and there's, there's such a, even with hardship, there's such an innocence to it in terms of you have your, you have your whole life ahead of you. And I think for young people, it's so important for them to be able to see that um, because, you know, mental health and depression are just so rising with our young people and, and, and the world is so scary, especially this past year for so many layers on top of layers. Um, I think it's just so important for, for to spark that, that creativity and that imagination and the possibilities. Yeah. yeah. From, oh, go ahead, Ray. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Everything that you've said, Kim, resonates so much um, for me. And um, like, I think, yeah, that piece about knowing that like there's so much life left or there's life beyond. Like when I think about um, trans people, like we have the highest suicide risk of any 
group of people and um, particularly for trans youth. And there are a lot of bills right now in a lot of states that are aimed at you know, preventing access to gender affirming care for minors, making it a crime for, for instance, parents to support their child's gender transition, um, barring kids from playing sports, requiring genital inspections. Um, and so like something in, in my book, like my book doesn't deal with such heady policy topics, but it does deal with the fact that like, there can be a like, there can be like a bully and an unsupportive parent and you can be really struggling and you can also have a wonderful group of friends and meet people who are like you, um, who are doing things that you want to do. And it might not like everything that you want might wind might not wind up perfectly and there's still going to be stuff that you have to deal with and there's also a story that goes on beyond the end of the the book so to speak beyond like this moment in your life um and yeah that's important to me yeah exactly so for me it's that this there's so much hope I think in this age group like you're experiencing so much at the, that age when you're a teenager and like I said you're kind of figuring yourself out you're figuring out who you want to be and things are really hard and I think teenagers feel everything so so fully and we lose that a little bit kind of as we get older or at least in my experience and so I find that ha like that that those emotions being so raw and so real um is very it's very relatable. We all go through it. I think there's something about those teen years that no matter what kind of decade or era you've grown up in, there is like this thread of familiarity for everybody. Like we've all been there, right? We all know those feelings of insecurity, those feelings of what am I going to do with my life? What do, what do I see in my future? And I, I just think if I can provide or write a book that is like, I came out on the other side and I'm okay. And you're going to be okay too. <laughs> I think there's something really hopeful there. Right. So I almost like to try at least with, you know, Fat Chance Charlie Vega, take some of the lessons that took me a long, long time to learn, to understand and to get to, and put those in a book. And hopefully someone else can get to it a little sooner than I did. And then mm -hmm. it maybe helps them and they can go out and do good things, right? Like maybe they feel better about their body. They spend less time worrying about dieting. They just wanna be more empathetic. All of those things would be great, right? So like to me, that is, is kind of everything when I'm thinking about the audience and they're ready and what, they're ready to talk about these topics. You know, they want real stories. And so I think we're all doing a, hopefully a, a good service by respecting them sharing these stories, yeah. talking about real topics and being like, it is really hard. <laughs> like life is scary sometimes, but there is still tremendous hope and here you'll be okay. And I think all of our books try to try to do that. Like give them a little hug and be like, you're going to be all right. It's going to be good. <laughs> Thank you all. Um, now um, our next question I also find very interesting. Um, and I've had a lot of trouble thinking about this myself um, as a Latina living in the U.S. Whenever a book comes about this topic, I tend to be very defensive. Uh, and so the question is, <laughs> how do you feel about authors writing about under underrepresented groups they don't actually belong to? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> I used to be more forgiving, I think, a couple of years ago. I'm not that forgiving. I'm not, you know, <laughs> you can, you can, you can write, I, I see, you can write whatever you want to write. Um, if you write about a, a Black main character and you're not Black, I'm personally not going to buy it um, because I'm just not interested in it because that person doesn't have that lived experience. And I think that that's something that you have to sort of recognize and, and understand because the representation has been so poor, um, you know, um, you know, and every community sort of has representation that that is sort of, you know, shared in a certain way um, for, for Black representation broadly. Um, it's, you know, there's so, too many stereotypes. Um, there's too many sort of imaginations about what that is, what a home life or experience is like. 
Um, and I find a lot of people, they care, right? You want to write it because you care. But I think there's a difference between me as a Black author who has been in many homes and stayed over the night um, many, many times at other people's homes who are different than myself on top of my own community. And my ability to navigate a broad array of diverse characters is often, not always, very different than someone who doesn't have that representation. And so I think you have to ask yourself why. And, and, and really why, why this particular story? Why are you the one to tell it? Why do you want to tell it? Um, and do you have the skills and the experiences to tell that story? And only you can answer that. Um, but I'm just gonna say, I'm probably not gonna buy it. <laughs> and I'll give like one very, one very specific example of that, you know, when I was much more forgiving, you know, like maybe a little more than five years ago, um, I saw a cover with a, um, it was the first time I'd seen a cover with a black girl on the front. And it was like a black girl and a white girl on the front of a cover. And I was so excited because I had never really seen a young adult book with a black girl on the cover. And it was sort of a time I really wasn't kind of paying attention to the author. I just was like, like, let me read it. And I read the first chapter and the first chapter was filled with like, it didn't resonate with me. And it had a lot of sort of use of, of slurs and other kinds of things because they were, they were trying to tell a story where it it showed that like racism occurs and bias, but it was done in such a, um, I found a harmful, unnecessary way that I just would never write. And as a black reader, why would I want to write this, read this and read it in the first chapter? And then I did my own investigation and I was like, oh, ah, it's someone who cares about these particular issues, but they're not from that community. And so they didn't know how to approach it in the kind way. And, and it was like at that moment that I was like, yeah, I'm done. There's enough now black writers that I can read from. Um, and I have the same philosophy with other identities. I am not interested in reading an author about um, a trans person if the author is not trans, um, if they're not Latinx, if, they're, um, if they don't have a background being undocumented in their family and the stories about that. I'm just not interested in it. And so I can go off on this particular topic. Um, so I'm going to just stop talking about this particular topic. Yeah, I think for me, um, I, th I think about this topic a lot too. Um, and particularly in like the own voices conversation, it's been interesting to like navigate that, like what that means for trans people because um, it doesn't map on super neatly to us because there can be a lot of questioning and a lot of uncertainty leading up to like um, embracing your identity and like um, so I think that I am probably still in the slightly more forgiving area when it comes to like trans representation because I know like sometimes people can write trans characters um, and I've seen this too, where I've read books. Um, I'm also a sensitivity reader where I've read like manuscripts that haven't come out yet where I'm like, this rep is really good. <laughs> you actually didn't need me. Are you sure you're sis? Like, <laughs> are you sure? <laughs> like, <laughs> um, so I think um, for me, it can be a little bit more case by case basis, but I think like, again, like speaking to trans rep specifically, um, I think like a lot of cisgender writers, you know, like want to like have that savior mentality or want to like, you know, give voice yeah. to the trans community. Um, and um, you really don't need to do that. And the only time that you should ever be writing like a trans main character ever is if you have like, Kim, you were talking about like the diversity you have in your communities. If you have a lot of trans people in your life and it's not just your kid mm -hmm. or it's your mm -hmm. one, not just your one friend who's, who's trans or it's not just your like partner who is transitioning. Like if you're surrounded by trans people, if you're constantly in dialogue with mm -hmm. us about things that yeah. have nothing to do with being trans, like maybe then you can write a trans main character. Mm -hmm. And even then, like I wouldn't be writing about like a core experience. Like I wouldn't be writing like a coming out story 
or anything like that. Um, but um, yeah, that's my opinion. I could also go off on this. I feel like that could be like a whole panel. <laughs> yeah, I totally, totally agree with what's already been said by Kim and Ray. I mean, you, I think, have to go into it with the utmost care if you are going to even venture into it. Like there are so many layers, right? Like, so it's complicated because if you're an own voices writer, uh, that does require a bit of bearing your soul in, in some kind of way. And it gets murky if it's it, like LGBTQ authors, like, are you having to out yourself? And yeah. like, so it gets, it yeah. gets complicated. It's, too, it's complicated, good but point. I, I will say though, um, if you are going, like there is diversity in your life. So even if you are a white cis, a, a fill in the blank here, there has to be something in your life <laughs> that feel that is feels or has made you feel slightly different than other people, right? So it can be like, oh, I deal with anxiety or, oh, my family structure is way different than how I, my other friends grew up. So. Uh -huh there are, are things that count, like those are diversity, right? Like not having a, a, a mom, a dad, a dog, and like two and a half siblings, like that, that's diversity. So like expanding, I think how we think about diverse representation, I think can be a good place to start. Like you don't have to be the person who's like, I am writing the great American novel about what it's like to be fat but I'm thin and I've never been fat before right like because that is there you're probably going to run into a lot of uh tropes without meaning to harmful stereotypes without meaning to like there's just there's a lot if you don't have that lived experience and then like Ray said if you're not in that community if, if, if you're not surrounded by people who have that same identity it's going to be really hard but I think you can use your own experience um and there there are ways that you can think about representation in maybe beyond just like race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, and, mm -hmm. and like, like help uplift those other writers who are telling those stories, you know, like that's a great way, I think, to be a great ally is to be like, you know what, that's actually not my lane to talk about a coming out story. However, here are three fantastic books that I can recommend to you that you would really like. So it may not be the thing you wanna take on <laughs> as your main story, but, but I think that you can still be someone who helps, right? And who helps uplift others and helps share those stories. Um, just not so much in like the, this is my thing. You don't want to be a savior. You never want to come in yeah. and be like, it is my job to make everyone understand. <laughs> that yeah. is great advice, Crystal. That is great <laughs> advice for everybody. <laughs> um, so unfortunately, we're coming to the end um, of, our, of our panel. And um, there's just, there's a couple of questions that... Uh, they're really good. Uh, and I don't want to have to choose. So maybe we can do this really fast. Um, so the question that is probably not going to be so fast, but um, hopefully we'll, we'll be able to fit them all in is um, how did writing your story help you accept yourself? Oh, that's a big one. <laughs> I will say for me, um, it helped me kind of revisit who I was, I think, as a teenager and really appreciate all that that version of myself went through um, and think about what I would have liked <laughs> to have known at that age or what I what would I have liked someone to say to me when I was that age. And it was kind of nice to be able to go back and say that to myself through a book in a weird way. Like, so, so the character of Charlie is like an extension of me. So what would I have liked to have had happen? And I think that definitely helped me as an adult feel more, I think, okay with myself. And even like afterward hearing the reception after people have read the book and who have connected with it, I think that helped me feel like I, I did what I set out to do, right? Like I wanted people to feel represented by this book and feel seen. And so that helps solidify like, yeah, we do need stories like these. We do need things that help people feel validated in their experiences. So I think that's been the big thing for me. 
Yeah, I think for me, like um, committing to the nuance of the experience and not like watering it down to make it more palatable or more educational or anything like that was a way for me to like honor the reality of my experience and like the experience of so many other trans people too. Yeah. Yeah, really similar things. I can't think of anything else to add to that. All right, well, thanks everybody. And then our last question um, is, can the authors please recommend agents or publishers open to multicultural stories? Um, so if you I, guys have any names to drop. <laughs> I would say um, a DV Pit um, is one great place to start. That's how I found my agent. It is a pitch mm -hmm. event that happens on Twitter um, where there's a day where you can pitch your book, agents roll through and they like your pitch and then you can kind of query them directly and it's designed specifically for marginalized authors. It's so wonderful and I've met so many people and made community through it. So that would be my recommendation. Hashtag DV Pit. Mm -hmm. Um, I would say manuscript wish list is a great place to start to start just looking at what agents are looking for. You want to find agents that are aligned with what you're trying to put out there, right? Who, what books have they already um, helped get representation for? What, what, are, what have they done prior? What clients do they work with? That I think gives you a sense of if they would be interested or open to, uh, being you know having you query to them and then the other piece of that is like do you want to work with that agent right so like look at what that agent has done and the books they've represented and like you want someone who's not going to change the heart of your book you you want someone who's not going to say this is good but can we make it a little more traumatic right like you don't want people who are going to change what you're trying to do um, so I think that piece of it is important. Like we get, well, I think we get so excited to have representation and to feel like, oh my God, someone's interested in our book that sometimes we let people change or we feel like we need to let people change what our story is and what we're trying to do. And you don't have to do that. You can just find someone else who, who gets you and hopefully represents you and gives you the respect that you deserve. Yeah, totally agree. Um, and, you know, so if you're looking specifically for, say, for example, a, a person of color who's in publishing, this POC in publishing, and they have um, a website and, a, and social media, and it at least has that sort of like diverse representation, at least um, racial and ethnically. Um, the other is just look at the, the diverse books that you really enjoyed and look who represents those people. So for example, if you looked at me and uh, Cemetery Boys, we both are represented by Jennifer March Soloway, who was a newer agent that, you know, almost all the people that she represents um, have a, you know, um, marginalized identity. Like look for people who actually really do want to rep those books and not just because something happened in that particular community. And then they decided that they are like, oh, I want to like represent someone from this community because I like really want to help or like, oh, this might sell fast, that kind of thing. Like, I think if you are a diverse writer, you want someone who actually has sold books that are diverse and that their clients have stayed with them, which is a really, really important thing to pay attention to because there are some people out there who um, talk a lot about diversity, but if you look at their clientele on their website, they have no at least visible representation of diversity, but they're talking a lot about it. So it's like, you don't represent anybody of these identities. Um, and so I think that's a really important piece is just to look at who represents, and you can do it like either by the, reading the book or you can do it by just going on their social media and seeing like an author and seeing like who represents them. And, and I love to look at their like social media feed. So like, for example, if the entire past year, you have not said anything about what has been happening in the world, you have not said anything about George Floyd or Black Lives Matter, I have no interest in sending any of my materials to you. That's just not who I want to represent me. And that's sort of my like, my level of like 
uh, you have to be conscious and outwardly conscious. And if you're too concerned about what other people are going to think, we're not going to be right, the right fit. You know, it might be the right fit for someone else, but you're not going to be the right fit for me. And I think finding out what's the right fit for you and what you're looking for. Well, thanks everybody. You guys have shared some awesome resources with us today from, you know, advice and resources for parents to aspiring writers. Um, and talking to you has been a really wonderful experience. It really was a joy to read your books. I recommend it to everybody that is in the audience. These books are so, so fun and, and wonderful to read. Um, and I think we have come to the end of our session today. Yes, thank you so much, Natalia, Crystal, Ray, Kim. This was great. So informative and so important. We really appreciate you being here. And this is the last session of the day of the Newburyport Literary Festival for 2021. So thank you for um, being the amazing end to our two days. And for everyone who's watching, thank you for coming. Thank you for participating. Fingers crossed we're going to be in real life next year, but we're hoping that we can also keep some of the online part so that we can continue to connect with people who are all over the country and the world. Again, thank you all so much, so much. We're so grateful and I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Hi everybody. Thanks, great to see you. Bye -bye. Great to see you. Thank you for everything. <laughs>